bring bad news. The cities have won, and we designers planners have lost. We have to come to terms with the fact that cities are probably more like light, ambiguous, not planned, not entirely organic and constantly in motion. Let me illustrate that by going through a little time lapse that reveals 18 years of growth of two of Asia's largest cities, Chengdu and Chongqing. What you see is that organic forces are at play, and they really make almost these arms, these urban tentacles form where they weren't planned, even though every inch of these cities was planned. This is what I call mud, or market-driven, unintentional development. And mud defies design. What happens is that we feel we're in control of these individual settlements and we design them to the last doorknob. But in reality, as we zoom out on the map, these individual settlements, they morph together. Macro-planned becomes micro-organic. When we started this project, we went to investigate 400 new cities that China wanted to build by 2020. Each city, one million people. In reality, what we found was one true megalopolis of over 400 million people already in 2005. Now today, 10 years later, almost, China wants to put forward another mega ambition, designing 100 eco-cities. It's obvious to say that reality will knock at the door again. And we learned that the hard way. This is the first project we developed in China, an eco-city CBD. We did all the usual green thinking, but as we zoomed out, it became clear that the traditional ideas really no longer worked. In fact, China reveals that very fundamental ideas have to be let go. What does it mean to design a zero carbon city when this little speck is connected to the power grid in China that is 80% coal-fired. This spec is built on, if you see here, a really completely polluted environment, a brownfield. Or even that many of the ideas we have, very simple ideas such as making a pedestrian-friendly environment, is not allowed according to regulations. And these regulations are in trouble, not just in China, but globally. So we felt compelled to really zoom out and look at the national scale to try something that everybody says, integrated design, but it's almost impossible. This image reveals that China is by and large one big brownfield. So looking at the map as individual dots really doesn't mean anything anymore. We need to consider where the people are living. These are the densest areas in China that really reveal six mega areas, true megalopolises. They are the size of France and the density of a small American town. So something rather unique and unseen. And still there's hope, because with such a concentration, you can at least begin to target the problems. This map reveals the consumption of energy overlaid with where the people are living. So it's still some sort of concentration. We set out to tackle the first real contradiction. Could we make these places really renewable? The beauty of China is that it has already in place all these ultra-high voltage networks, basically cables that allow you to transport energy over long distances without the loss of too much efficiency. They are now connected to coal fields. So what we said was, could we look at solar energy, wind energy, biomass, geothermal and such, and only take the coal-rich areas and convert them to renewable? Lines are in place, and it actually revealed that even today you would have a completely renewable China. But we were looking at 2030, and then you're missing 12% of energy. So what we needed to do was really make cities more efficient. And individual cities wouldn't work, so instead we formulated this new way of looking at the map. What if we just consider where the energy is, where the infrastructure is, where the money is, economic impetus, and where the people are living? It reveals an entirely new network, these dots, this catchment area of where you could have eco-cities, a beautiful, almost contiguous network. But these conditions also reveal that the truth, the original thinking of eco-cities really couldn't be applied. This image shows you that China, in the last 25 years, has duplicated every single urban settlement, from the small town to the mega-cities, 
by expanding these vast industrial underutilized areas. Terrible, but some hope for me. These areas have the infrastructure, and we can begin to intensify them. We take this coarse, car-orientated grid, very unpedestrian-friendly, and we refine it, in this case, superimposing this public transportation network and green corridors. And then we refine it further with the network for bikes and pedestrians. These massive plots slowly begin to refine into a human scale. This grid in itself, then, is only the starting point. They eat into the existing cities, because building eco-cities is not going to contribute much to the problem. We need to upgrade the existing cities. So you see here how slowly, in Nanchong, our green network eats into the old city. This is an aerial view. If you take that to the scale of China, it really means that there is one vast connected city, a cloud city, where we can trace almost 500 eco-hubs that don't require any new expansion. These are the new eco-centers working together to clean up the rivers, to clean up the soil. A very similar rationale can be applied to the other scale, the micro-scale India. In this case, we did a big project in Mumbai. Here it's not about connecting cities, it's about connecting people. Top-down planning doesn't meet in this case, two-thirds of the people living in slums in informal settlements. We mapped these settlements very, very carefully, and it became immediately clear, and we hope to policymakers as well, by making this large model, that the slum areas hold vast potential, and you can't avoid them. Even though they're not in the official plans, they are everywhere. Whatever you're going to plan top-down, you're going to meet these types of settlements. We even want to suggest that slums, informal settlements, hold real potential for future urbanization globally. They have extreme density, and they already have such a sophistication, both socially and spatially, that they should be understood as urban microcosms. But how can we begin to patch these individual cells together? What allows us to evaluate this type of fabric? Time, just as in China, looking at how long it takes from one city to the next. In India, we look at time. How long does it take you to the nearest school, hospital, to the nearest station? Time scarcity becomes a new human-centric lens to look at the city. If you're talking about time travel, commuting time, you need to talk about transportation. And that means money. Currently, it's big money invested in big infrastructure. World's largest democ democracy, we really want to kind of reflect how people are using infrastructure. So we're proposing that money to be funneled more towards the pedestrian. Could start very, very simple. Skywalks already in place, now just badly engineered, could become a little bit more humane by adding seating. And if you ask me, I would say, let's make it women-only seating, immediately transforming this experience. So it's a, an ecology of solutions that local communities should embrace and take further. If you look at the existing large-scale transportation corridors, as they cut through these densest areas in the city, they barely reach the people. So we set out to do Skywalks 2.0, the Sky Ride, large circles that cut right through the densest areas in the city. In this case, it could be a double-decker. You get onto the auto rickshaw on the second level, and you zip to the nearest station very efficiently. The point being, that transportation, especially local transportation, becomes the backbone for greenifying slums and cities such as Mumbai. Another example is the land link, the answer to the sea link. This is a pipeline existing between two major slums in Mumbai, close to two million people. We simply draw this white line and allow auto rickshaws to connect the two. As planners, this is really all we can do, connect and patch. And then on top of that, we hope that social and new public space can emerge. The land link almost being the first slum CBD or slum skyline in the world. But in a city like Mumbai, it's not traffic that is the biggest problem. It's water infrastructure. It comes in with rain, it's still blue, but passes through the system very quickly turning black. And this system, now top-down, linear, approach is really just about expanding, reaching further and further into these reservoirs, obviously never meeting demand. So we're proposing micro-solutions, localized solutions. And for the slum areas, it's very, very feasible. 
you look at the surface, because people in the slums consume so little compared to the rest of us, you can actually meet demand relatively easily. But it all falls in about three months, so you need to be able to store it. We started to expand on this ecology of solutions. In this case, the water wall. It's a load-bearing wall that actually allows you to capture that rainwater, and light trickles in as well through your walls in your rather dim apartment. Or the weather tap, which collects rainwater during the monsoon, filters it, provides drinking water. And during the summer, the hot days, it collects solar heat that takes this energy to make salty water into drinking water. Or even simpler and cheaper, the, the groove, which is a cocoa core, a simple roof solution that turns your slum into ideally a green oasis. The real benefit is that in the heat, your home is much less uncomfortable and hot, while in the monsoon, it's much less noisy with all the clatter of the rain. Some grassroots solutions that begin to connect and reach out to turn Mumbai green from the inside out, working to combine three sides, both official city, slum, and public space. In this public space, we installed our first installation for Mumbai, the water bench, really aimed at parks. And this is the double installation. The black part is underground, and rain trickles in through these button inlets. And slowly, during the monsoon, the tanks fill up. And then, during the, the dry season, you can recycle that water to irrigate your parks. Now, I came with bad news, but I have some good news as well. It seems if we stop building new cities altogether, they're just sources of more sprawl. We can begin to focus on upgrading our existing urban landscape, making them livable and sustainable. Thank you.